the person coming to speak to us has a passion. And I want all of us to stand and welcome Dr. Kenyan Jui, who is coming to speak to us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's make him feel welcome. <laughs> Hallelujah. Karibu, 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 karibu. Dr. Bless you. like this. I'll be using both. You are a church of very high standards. I loved the pulpit. I feel like I'm the president. The screens, my goodness. I did not want to ask the bishop, but I want to congratulate you for having such screens. But what touched me the most is the timer. Pentecostal churches don't have the timer. They release themselves to the Holy Ghost. I realize this church, you know that the Holy Spirit knows time. I was preaching a pastor's conference in the US, and then I was explaining how I narrate all my topics for a whole year. And it's true even this year. I can tell you what I'll be speaking in December. And one pastor said, excuse me, doc, where is the place of Holy Spirit in all this? You don't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I told them, the Holy Ghost knows even what will happen in December. Do you know, do you know the Bible? prophesize even what will happen in eternal future. I love this church. Where are the membership forms? <laughs> you, you guys, when you go to heaven, you want to come back. <laughs> the worship, oh my God, where is that gentleman who was in white? Then even your pastor can sing. Why, why did God give me so few talents? <laughs> my goodness. Let me invite Mercy to join me here to help us read the word of God. We came with our two children. They, uh, they normally attend the first service, and they attended the first service with us. The second service, they decided to go to the desk where we have some of our books. Is that okay? Yes. Now, this is the mic that works. Good morning, church. Praise the name of the Lord. Wow, this is an amazing place. I can see what you've been seeing for when I was down there. <laughs> My name is Mercy. I'm so grateful to God for giving us this opportunity to come and worship together with you. And thanks, Bishop and Mom, once again. We don't take it for granted. It's such a big honor for us. Always grateful to God for giving me life, for saving me from the time of I was a young girl to now. I trust him only to lead me now to the up to the time I will cross to the other end and live with him forever. I'm just going to keep you standing for a while as we read the scripture. We are going to be reading Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 to 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 to 9. And I read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words, which I command you this day, shall be in your heart. And you shall, be, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit, and shall talk to them when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hands, and they shall be as front hands between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. And that's the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we humbly come to you to pray that you may anoint the hearers. You may anoint the speaker. You may anoint your word. Use me, Lord, to reach families, to reach marriages, to reach children and the youth who are yet to be parents. May your Holy Spirit take control and take over. May you restore us. May you heal us. If anyone came in this service and they don't know you as Lord and Savior, may the preaching of your word bring them to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Just to help you relax, look at your neighbor, tell them you're looking good. Can I, can, can I, Tell them you're going to learn something today, for sure. You will learn something today. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing a campaign about intentional parenting the world over wherever I go. 
It's one of my three greatest passions. The other one is marriage and the other one is purpose. Discovering your purpose in life. And today I want to invite you to walk with me through what I call intentional parenting. I recognize there are some youth in our midst and young people and others who are not parents wondering is this service relevant for me? And for your comfort, from my perspective, every child in your neighborhood looks up to you. You are parent to any child within your compound. In 1848, Richard Dangdale, a New York prison warden, realized that six of the inmates were from one family. Intrigued by the phenomenon, he decided to track down their family history. And he realized that they all came from a family of a man by the name Max Jukes. Together with his wife, they were in and out of prison on several occasions because of reverend misconduct in the streets of New York. They had four girls and two boys. When they studied 1,200 of their descendants, they realized that 52% Precisely 52.4% of all girls that were born in that family ended up as prostitutes. 310 of them were paupers and homeless. 300 died before the age of 30. 180 were alcoholics, 160 were drug addicts, 150 were incarcerated in prison for an average of 13 years each. 67 of them died of syphilis and a killer disease, and 13 of them had committed murder. All of them from the same family. They decided to check statistics from a very contrasting family of a man by the name Jonathan Edwards. For those of you who've gone maybe for theological seminaries, this is the man who preached the greatest sermon perhaps known, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards, together with his wife of that one year until the day he died, they were blessed with 11 children. When they studied 1,400 of their descendants, what became of these people? They found out 13 of them became college presidents, 66 of them were university professors, another 66 were physicians, senior doctors, 75 of them either served in the army or in the navy, 85 of them were lawyers, including 32 U.S. state judges. 80 of them wrote books that sold all over US and Canada. And a hundred of them were senior government officials, including the governors, the senators, one comptroller of the US Treasury, and the third vice president of the US, Vice President Aaron Burr, who served under Thomas Jefferson, all of them from one family. Now, that was 1884. I wonder what the statistics would reveal today in the year 2019. I want to suggest today, or oh, there's little you can do about your ancestors. There is something you can do about your descendants. A parent's influence goes to the fourth generation long after they are gone. And today I want to share with you some four principles on intentional parenting. Number one, understand your child. Understand your child. <laughs> In the 1968 Summer Olympics, John Stephen Awari was scheduled for marathon in Mexico. During the race, he hurt his leg so badly on the 19th minute he couldn't run. He dragged his feet to the finishing line. About one hour, 15 minutes later, he crossed the finishing line. The reporters went over to him and asked him, sir, what was your inspiration? What inspired you to keep on running after the stadium lights had gone out and the medals were already awarded? John Stephen Awari looked straight into the eyes of the journalists and said, Excuse me, gentlemen and ladies, when my country, the nation of Tanzania, sent me to this country thousands of miles away and paid the air ticket, they never sent me here to compare myself with the other three. They sent me here to finish the race. And there's a scripture to that effect. 2 Timothy 4 7. I have fought the good fight of faith, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I want to start right there because I used to go to schools. I lost count at about 400 of them. And the number one accusation almost every child told me is that parents keep on comparing them. Teachers keep on comparing them. In fact, they always award the top three students. Mom is always asking, I'm not like my brother, I'm not like my sister. I want to start there because I have found some peculiar behaviors with Kenyan parents. For example, all Kenyan parents, when they were primary school and high school, in classroom, they all used to be number one. 
Number two parents are in Uganda. <laughs> All Kenyan parents are well behaved, especially if they are delivered like you. Peer pressure, negative peer pressure comes from our neighbors. I'm still looking for your neighbor. How many can make a confession? This is Sunday morning. Sunday you cannot afford to cheat. I want to ask you a question. You should not cheat in a day, but especially on a Sunday. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How many can confess one day you are driving somewhere? Let's name. Let's call it Nakuru. And when you pass to Viru, there is someone who passed you Kimadharao. You got so upset and you decided to prove that you also rule in the highways. You stepped on that accelerator and graciously you are able to overtake that character. Slightly after overtaking this guy, he turns on his way to my mind. You wasn't going to Nakuru after all. How many are guilty? <laughs> now, here is the deal. In the high of life, we get into this highway at different times, travel at different paces, and exit at different times. You shouldn't be competing with another driver. You don't know the potential of their car. You might even be loyal in your speed. There is a child presented by a parent in our midst who could be good in swimming and basketball. He's a class prefect and he's good in academics. There's another child presented by the same parent. If he or she tried all the four items I named, they will flop. Don't pressurize them. Can I ask you a question? Do you honestly believe the child who used to be number one in high school or in primary school is necessarily doing the best in life today? Not necessarily the case. You see, while you can prepare the road for your child, you should prepare your child for the road. You should let them know that there are people who can drive faster than them, and it's all light. The Apostle Paul says, I have finished the race set before me. The race, the, the, the race is an English word. That conjunction means it is particular, it is specific. You don't need to be rewarded for the race you are enrolled, not running another person's race. There's a reward awaiting you and your child when you finish it and finish it faithfully. And the Apostle Paul says, personally, I have understood my mission to the Gentiles. I've gone all over Asia Minor. I've done all this. I have now finished my race. What is your race? That's the question. I want to ask you a question. Talk to me if you can. The master was going on a distant land and he gave some talents to his servants. The first person was given some five talents, worked hard, returned how many in total? Ten. Fantastic. The first service, they got it wrong. <laughs> then they made corrections. We are not comparing them, remember? <laughs> they first told me five. <laughs> and I love my A class. This is my A class. <laughs> Adult children are good. And the master said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Let's try another one. The second servant was given some two talents. Worked very hard. Return how many total? For and the master said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. Now notice they were committed equally, although they didn't perform equally. The master knew he didn't endow them equally. He didn't expect equal returns on his investment. Does that make sense? The third servant was given one talent. He worked hard, returned how many total? Before I continue, remember this. This was a good man. He feared he may lose his money. So he decided to keep it safe and deliver it back to the master. He did not want to risk it. Because of that fear, one, he lost his talent. And God's maths are very interesting. That talent was not given to the one who had four. It was given to the one who had ten. I believe some of you seated here, I have your talents. You've been sitting on your talent and God has been giving me. What you don't use, you lose. The talents you don't use, you lose. You don't lose your gifts. Let me, but let me make a disclaimer here. You lose talents, but you don't lose gifts. God's gifts are irrevocable. They are without repentance. But God's talents are lost. What's the difference? Talents are passed on to you genetically through your parents. They are heredity. But gifts are divine endowment, divine callings. God gives you directory. You just waste away your gifts. That's why you can speak in tongues and heal the sick and go to hell. That's why Jesus said we shall not know them by their gifts. We shall know them by their fruit. You can be gifted and go to hell. Can I shock you? Satan is anointed. In fact, the only angel, the Bible says, the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28. 
He never lost his power. He never lost his gifts. He never lost his beauty. Those of you who think he looks like a monkey with a tail, you're wrong. In fact, the Bible says he must create like the age of light. And those of you who joke with the enemy, I want you to know the Bible is serious. We fight against powers and principalities. He never lost his power. That's a lesson for another day. And Jesus knew he's the prince of darkness. He never lost his power. God's gifts are without repentance. But they waste away. But God's talents can be lost. But that's not the end of the story. The man was judged for it. And the master said, why didn't you give my money to Equity Bank? Or KCB or Barclays or Stanchard? You know, I have to mention many banks, lest I annoy some of you. <laughs> I would have gotten it back with some interest. Go where they swear in a nation of teeth. Although the Bible doesn't mention the word hell, where do you think they swear in a nation of teeth? Why? Laziness. Jesus never said he committed adultery. Jesus never said he murdered anyone. But laziness. Now, for the benefit of those who come to church only when there's a guest speaker, and they're wondering how everybody knows the story, the story is in Matthew 25. Matthew 25. What is the message here? Your responsibility as a parent is to create an enabling environment for this child to learn to hear God's voice. No one was able to write. That was too fast. Let me say what, you remember? I'm not to blame. Your timer. Can I say it one more time? Your responsibility is to create an enabling environment for your child to learn to hear God's voice. Don't compare them. Create the environment. Understand them. Know them. They have different personalities, different gifts, different talents. Principle number two. Train your child. Train your child. We have trains in Kenya. And a train is nothing more but the aging of the locomotive. Everything else hooked up to the train, we call them coaches. They can be three or ten or twenty. The aging is a train, nothing else. The idea behind the English word train means whenever the aging, the train moves, the coaches follow. They don't choose the direction. They are trained in a given direction. If the train turns right, all the coaches turn right. If the train turns left, they all turn left. They are trained in a given direction. They don't choose the direction. To train means, if Friday night you reach home three in the morning, fathers, you're telling your son, don't reach home three in the morning drunk. Reach at six. I've shown you the way. Fathers to train means, if you are beating their mother, you are telling your son, don't leave it at the beating level. Fracture her leg. I've set the pattern for you. Fathers to train means, if you don't want your daughters to commit adultery, stop committing adultery. In training, you don't tell people what to do. You show them what to do. After this service, don't tell them what I told you. Show them what I told you. We would like to produce a CEO. We want our children to become governors and senators. We want our children to be government leaders. In reality, however, you don't produce who you want. You produce who you are. You produce your type. You produce your kind. You reproduce in the life of your child. If there are things you don't like about your kids, you may not like this. This could be a mirror of who you are, your true character. You can cheat us in church. You can cheat everywhere else, but you never cheat your kids. Eventually, you reproduce yourself. You see, they never call themselves Christians in that great city of Antioch. The city dwellers observe their mannerisms and they say, these guys walk like Christ. They talk like Christ. They love each other like Christ. They are Christ-like. They are Christians. That's where the term comes from. Some parishioners asked St. Francis of Assisi, preacher, how and when should we preach? He replied, preach all the time. If necessary, use words. In the words of General Douglas MacArthur, a good general does not push his soldiers from behind. He leads them from in front. What that means is this. If there is anything you are doing that you don't want your children to do, stop doing it. You can only effectively teach what you consistently model. The most effective way to inspire others is to bring out the best out of your own life. The overflow of your life is what influences other people. So you've got to take stock of how you're running your life and ask yourself, how would I want my kid to follow me? What adjectives do they use in their daily vocabulary? How do they manage their anger? How do they see us managing as man and wife? How do they see me managing my frustrations in life? Can you allow them to peek behind the curtains and see how you manage 
removed stress from your boss or from your work. Lead them by your life. You see, I've written a couple of books. There's a book I did about parenting. It's called Parenting Today. And I deliberately chose the picture of an elephant and a calf. The idea is this. That little calf does not decide the journey, the direction, the grazing fields, the water spots. The little calf believes the mother has done the research. The little calf believes the mother knows the way. The little calf does not even decide the journey or the direction or the path. She just follows the mother. We read in the scriptures, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. God giving very particular instructions to Moses. And we used to practice these things when we were in high school. We would put a badge. Jesus says, where did that religion go? That old time religion. How, how many were like me? They were fanatics like me. You heard that thing Jesus says. I think we need to go back there. <laughs> And God told Moses four times a day you're going to teach them. Let me tell you this. You can be very spiritual and you lose your children. There is no substitute to teaching them. Now the word of God says teach them four times a day in the morning. When you sit at home in the evening and when they sleep. Four times a day. Can you imagine the average Muslim does that. They take them through madrasa. They pray five times a day and the prayers are led by the father. You can be here praying and fasting over Islam. But remember how much they have been indoctrinated. Look at Catholics. They go through catechism. Try to reach a Catholic and a Muslim. Then you realize the power of indoctrination. The average Jewish family, the father prays for the family three times a day. The average Pentecostal family, Mama, Ogoza Maombi. <laughs> you know. I did prayers in my house every day and we read one chapter of the Bible every single day. Until three weeks ago when Zeke challenged me and told me that if you ever want to read prayers in this house again, ask permission from me. I'll be leading prayers. We were a bit shocked because it was prayers time. But then I was excited that I have made him love my God. He has seen me pray. He has seen me read the scriptures. If your children are not coming to church, I want you to take stock of how you have been mentoring them. There's a missing link we need to address. Lesson number three. Connect with your child. Connect with your child. To connect means to deliberately, consciously create the time. We have time for what we value. We have time for who we love. We have time for who we value. Right now, the odds are high. Your phones are on silent mode. Some of you have even switched off your phones because you value what you're doing right now. There are people who may be looking for you and you may return their calls after the Sunday service in the priority of how much you value them. But there's a call that can come right now irrespective of what I'm saying. You walk out on me. You know you have time for who you value and what you value. If you're not creating time for your children, you might as well remember what I said. You live in deceit. You don't value them. I'm saying this because sometimes when I'm doing parental seminars in schools, I've had parents tell me, especially fathers, I have paid the fees. I have bought the books. What else do they need from me, Dr. Tari? Excuse me. Who made you Amref or Red Cross? <laughs> Why would you want to reduce yourself from a sponsor, from a father to a sponsor? If you have paid the school fees, you've done the indivisible minimum. Every other father has done that. You'd rather shut up and rise up from being a sponsor to a father. He who does not provide to his family, scripture says, is worse than an infidel. What is that? Not just financial provision, but emotional provision. Spiritual provision. The crisis in Kenya today, the back stops with the president. Continue to pray for him. That's the truth. If this church had an issue, it is the bishop. The back must stop somewhere. In the family, you can't desire the privileges of a father and not take the responsibilities of a father. I say this openly. If there was an issue in my family, never blame mercy. I will take full responsibility. I can't take 
I can't just desire to have the leadership position and not take the responsibility of leadership. The single moms in our midst, you are fully responsible for those kids and for the sake of the single moms. Let me tell you this. I never, ever, I've never, ever, ever in my lifetime worn a pink jacket in a Saturday service. I did this for you. Yeah, I've never, never. Now, on a serious note, I'm a very conservative person in dressing. I did this just for the single moms. We are meeting at 2 o'clock. To be honest, I'm very uncomfortable. I normally dress like bishop. But for the sake of single moms, I came to tell you there's a single moms meeting at 2 o'clock. Is that okay? Yes. We'll be talking a lot then. Now, I have deep honor and respect for President Nelson Mandela. I've quoted him the name of the person in most of my books. But sometimes I wonder, this was the greatest icon in the last 100 years. Deeply celebrated. Is it possible, having suffered 27 years in jail, having lost three of his own children to HIV AIDS, having broken his marriage, is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? He may have questioned his priorities. Is it possible? He may have thought, if I needed to save a great nation from apartheid and bring peace to humanity at large, just maybe, just maybe, I did need to start a family. I don't know. I leave you to be the judge. But I wonder who in this service would want to be the next CEO in their corporate organization. I wonder who in this service would want to be the most successful entrepreneur in Kenya. And I wonder who in this service would want to be the next cabinet secretary and lose his own daughter to HIV AIDS. Lose your son because he was involved in terrorism and that bullet brought him down. The only true Nobel read from the nation of Kenya. Professor Wagari Madai on her deathbed, she was quoted by the Daily Nation saying, the only thing I regret is that I never spent ample time with my own children. If I may paraphrase the good prof, she's telling us from her graveyard, I learned a little bit too late that parental responsibilities cannot be delegated. You can't pick it up from where you left. The growth of children are irreversible. You can't raise children by remote control. They will not wait for you first to buy the plots in Ruiru and put them up and then pick it up from where you left. You'll have to find that delicate balance and be there with them because you can have the money and lose them. If you invest in your child, you don't have to invest for your child. They come loaded with intelligence and their hands and their gifts. And you can live a fortune and they destroy it in three years. You see, Jesus never invested in buildings. He invested in people. Legacy is not what you leave behind. It's who you leave behind. And you can't do it unless you created the time with them. In his three years of public ministry, Jesus was with the people he mentored, not just every day, but every moment. They watched him from dawn to dusk. And that's what mentorship is all about. A dear friend of mine by the name Isaac was kajaked, taken to Gong Hills. The three abductors didn't believe he didn't have the cash. Like many of you, he believed in plastic money. So they said, we're going to finish you. But before doing that, we'll be gracious enough to give you our phone. Make your last call. Make your last call. Make your last call. Who do you think he called? The wife. What was the message? What was the message? What was the message? Kuna report mdosa na gojea. Nimeadika hiyo report. Let me tell you where the checkbook is. What was the message? Take care of our children. Take care of our children. Steve Jobs said this. Every time he woke up, he was trying to explain the secret of his success. He went to the mirror and asked himself this question. If today were my last day in life, would I do what I'm about to do right now? And when the answer was no, for two many days in a row, he knew there was something he needed to change. Three years ago, I was invited by Ladolix to the Abadeas Country Club. It's quite a cold place. This is free for men, free, free, free for men, married men, very free. 
If you ever invited to a very cold place for a seminar, renegotiate the terms for something warmer than the duvet. So I asked them, can I come along with my wife? And, 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 and they agreed graciously. When we reached there, we met a tour guide. I love animal documentaries. They are my favorite. So this guy said he's going to take us for a walk in the jungle. Not a drive, but a walk. So we asked him a natural question. What are the animals here? Giraffes, antelopes, zebras, baboons, warthogs. No, 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 that's not our question. Are there any cats here? He said, yeah, we have some leopards, but don't worry, just follow me. Now, I've got some bad news and good news for you. I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is this. My mercy, a woman who fears chameleons was so relaxed in this walk and her confidence was not in me. <laughs> have you ever felt insecure? <laughs> Her confidence was in a man she can't remember the name. <laughs> because the man knew the way. He was not a travel agent pointing to places he has never been. He was a tour guide leading the way. You know, I've seen some flyers from some Kenyan speakers inviting you for financial independence seminars. You look at the Pharaoh Shuadwada, who needs the message? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? God Almighty, who needs the word? Is he preaching to himself? No. The Pharaoh was leading us. One step, two steps, two hours into the jungle. And we actually went near giraffes and all that. Suppose the guy told us, Mtebesa wasawa, mkifika pari mchunge, kuna kuwa kana chui. Na kona watoto mchunge. Do you think we could have taken the walk? But the guy led the way. Now I want to tell you this. Lead the way. Let them see you doing it. For children, time equals love. Love equals time. They don't need your presence. They need your presence. Be there for them. Number four. Principle number four. Bless your children. Bless your children. Now, deep down in my heart, I would have preferred to share with you ten principles, but there's no time. I'll suggest you can pick this book. We have a few of them. Right there. It has all the ten principles. It's only 500 bob. If you don't have the money, do not worry. The message is on YouTube, free of charge. You can listen to the message. You just need to check my messages on parenting and you'll get them. For those of you who have an interest in disruption technology and discovering your gifts and the gifts in your kids, I have a little book called Blue Sky. I know I can see a couple of faces I recognize here. Those who have interacted in the corporate world, I have a book on reposition yourself. Focuses mainly on two things, how to personal brand and strategic thinking. And by the way, you'll never improve your circumstances until you improve yourself. You know, one of the reasons we, we hardly pick some of you is because you don't improve yourself. Last week, should I? I'll not tell you that. Let's talk in the afternoon. Let's talk in the afternoon. I have a book here. Be very careful when picking this book. I suggest most of you avoid it. It's called You Don't Need a Job. If you have a job, just avoid it. I'm a writer. If you read two pages, you resign. I'll not be responsible. <laughs> it's called You Don't Need a Job. There's a book I use for mentorship. I'll not talk about it today. And we came with a few copies. Bless your child. Are you there, number four? Words are never innocent. Words are either positive or negative. Words have the power to make and to destroy. Words have the power to build or to demolish. Words have the power to bless or to curse. God created everything through the spoken word. Words are never neutral. Born blind, deaf, and dumb, when she finally learned how to speak, Helen Keller eloquently said it this way, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my heart. I believe there's some validity to that observation. Because my mom had a brother. They named him Mureu. In my mother tongue, it means Mlevi, the drunkard. He drank Chang'a every day. When he finally kicked the bucket, nobody thought it twice to spend money to investigate into the causes of his death. Mrs. Kuri Nyamira, they called it Nyakimincha High School, translated in the Kisi language, the tale, and the school has never disappointed. <laughs> there is a school next to Nyakimincha known as Nyakoiba High School, in the Guzi language, is translated to mean the thief. KCC 2015, they stole all the examinations. <laughs> 
There's a school between Kakamega and Bugoma by the name Ebuchinga High School in Samluya dialects. Ebuchinga translation: the place of fools. No further comments. Oh my God, we have people there. I haven't seen you since I began. Oh my God. Oh my God. Anyone from Ebuchinga? <laughs> There's a school in Nyeri, they called it Kiagoma High School. Translation, the devil's high school. I understand four years ago, they renamed it to Mukurini High School. I think they got some revelation. You should have seen those boys when it was Kiagoma High School. God believes in names. He called a man by the name Abram, the barren one. We named him Abraham, the father of nations. Sarai, the barren womb. Sarah, the mother of nations. Jacob, a con man. Israel, the blessed man. His very name, Jesus Christ, sealed his other ministry, the anointed Savior. Through the lips of prophet Isaiah, God gave his name long before Jesus was born. You shall call him Emmanuel. Translation. God with us. And you still call your child Wajohi. Have you seen people naming their shops? Karumaidoba? <laughs> names are never innocent. No. Be careful with the names and the words you use. By far the largest tribe in Ghana is known as the Ashanti tribe. They have a unique way of naming their children. They name them after the day of the week in which the child is born. The children born on Monday have a given middle name Akwasi, translated in the Ashanti language to mean kind, generous, peace-loving, godly. Either by coincidence or otherwise, almost all Christian missionaries, great ministers, government leaders, corporate leaders, and great entrepreneurs in Ghana are the Akwasis. The children born on Wednesday have a given middle name, Akwaku, which means mean, arrogant, rough, terrible. Guess what? Government statistics reveal that over 75% of all crime in Ghana is committed by who? Akwakus. The power in a name. Dr. Mary Okello, one day, he invited me to speak in her school in a major meeting. And I decided to ask her the secret of her family to refresh your memory. Her elder brother, Moody Awori, was the ninth vice president of Kenya. Her younger brother, Agri Awori, Minister of Information Technology, Uganda. Her brother, Huntington Awori, chair KQ for many years. Her brother, Dennis Awori, chair Toyota Group many years. Her brother, Professor Nelson Awori, was the first doctor to conduct a successful kidney transplant on African soil. The facility in Upper Hill is named in his honor. Professor Judy Wakungu, an awori. Kwedo Panga, an awori. The current CEO, Bakris Bank, Jeremy Awori. Dr. Mirio Kelo herself with her husband, the proud owners of McKinney School. She was the first woman in Kenya to be a bank manager. The first woman in Africa to speak in Harvard School of Business. I thought there's something I can learn from this lady. So I asked her, what is the secret of your family's success? She told me, Doc, my dad, Jeremiah, Canon Jeremiah Awori, was an Anglican clergyman. Every single day, he blessed us. Every single day, he blessed us. He's the secret of what you're seeing in the Awori family today. When I speak to prisoners, they tell me the same thing. I'm exactly why my mama said I'm going to be. As I grew up, mama said, you are jail material. Here I am, as mama said it. I'll never forget one day I was preaching in a church in London. And I made a note call. And there was a man, in my estimate, about 60 years of age, who responded to the note call, a white man. And he was in tears. I dropped down the aisle and asked him, what's the issue, sir? How did you see men crying? with no restraint at all. And he said, look, I think you've been preaching about me all along. And I kept telling my son, he read up in jail, and as we speak today, he's serving his seventh term in jail. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruits their love. Every word you speak is either positive or negative. Every word you speak either activates the ageric realm or the demonic realm into action. The chief of general staff came to Jesus. He said, look, my servant is unwell. I believe he was talking about an army, an army man. 
And Jesus said, I'll come and pray over him. Jesus knew, give honor to the one honor is due. The general said, you don't need to come to my house. I know how things work. I'm a general. I say the word. And they fire the bullets. I say the word. And they leave the barracks. I say the word. And there is some action. Jesus, I know who you are. You don't need to come to my house. Just say the word. Just say the word. Just say the word. And demons will flee. Just say the word and sickness will leave. Just say the word. And Jesus said, I've never seen such faith all over Israel. Let me tell you this. In my long public speaking career, I've never once seen anyone who committed suicide before they confessed it. Because once you say it, the devil assigns a certain demon to ensure that assignment is executed to the letter. Ato kizema ka ugojo kangu. Hiu siguze hiyo ni yake. Patented. You see, the devil doesn't know what you're thinking. He gets hints, cues, and clues when you speak. You see, Jesus taught us, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be removed from here and planted in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, it shall be done. Jesus never said, does not doubt in his mind. Why? You're human. You can doubt in your mind. But once you speak it, you transfer it from your mind to your heart. So don't say things as they are. Say things as you expect them to be. Speak to me right now if you can. Let the weak say, I'm strong. If God can say, let the weak say, I'm strong. And God has no capacity to lie. There is nothing in his nature to lie. The Bible says, let every man be a liar, but God be true. If God can say to the weak, say you are strong, then I submit to you that the Bible is consistent that God calls things that are not as though they are. In class one, my daughter Ivy failed in all subjects. Kiswahili, she got a zero out of 50. There is something weird with zero. No matter what you multiply with zero, you still get a zero. So she got zero percent. And I'm busy inspiring other people. What a shame. <laughs> I should be demonstrating it in my house. I hired a tuition teacher. It's okay to hire a tuition teacher for class 8 or form 4. But imagine. But then I realized I was the problem. Masi and I didn't realize we never spoke Swahili in our house. And the girl did not understand even the very first question. Jina <laughs> laguni. So I remember talking to this lady teacher, don't label my daughter because labeling is enabling. And I stayed with them every single evening to hear, to see how she's teaching. Just teach Kiswahili. Fudisha izi maneno zageli. Don't motivate, don't encourage, that's my job. Just teach Kiswahili. We never saw results one year, two years. In class six, first term, in her school, Loretum Sogari, she was number one overall in a two-stream school and number one in Kiswahili. Don't say things as they are. Say things as you expect them to be. If you're listening to me and your husband can't come to church because of drunkenness, stop gossiping him with other women and start saying he's becoming a saint. He's coming to church. Confess what you want to happen, not your current reality. Speak the language of God. Let the poor say they are rich. Let the jobless say they have a job. Let the weak say, I am strong for what the Lord has done. I want to pray for you. And this is what I want to do. I want you to look at my eyes. If there's any time I don't want you to close your eye, it's now. Because I don't want to create an emotion. I want us to pray with understanding. The reason we ask people to come to the altar is because you're taking a step of surrendering to God. And I'm praying for three categories of people. Category number one, if a father or a mother spoke cursing words to you, words are powerful. They can patronize your progress the rest of your life. I want to break those curses right now. Galatians 3.13, Jesus became a curse that you may be blessed. No curse has power over you. The enemy cannot curse what God has blessed. But that curse must be broken. That curse must be lifted. If such words are spoken to you, whether they are alive or not, we are breaking those curses right now. Category number two. If you have spoken cursing words to your child, you'll never make it. You're a loser. Careless words. I want to pray for you. Number three. If you have spoken against yourself, 
You may not have realized you're casting yourself. I'm always played by men. I'm always a loser. I'm always a victim of joblessness. I'm sorry to say this. Even those who keep saying I'm always sick. I'm always having migraines. You have enabled the enemy to take possession of your health. So the first category, if somebody ever told you you'll never make it in life, you'll always be barren, you'll never succeed, you'll never have a good marriage. And this person had authority over your life, especially a parent. Stand on your feet and come here right now. Those three categories. Stand on your feet, come here right now. We are not going to put the songs or the music until you come. I want us to make that prayer. If I mentioned you in those three categories, just line up here. The reason we come to the altar call is to surrender to God's will and grace of our lives. The rest of us, we can stand. Those I mentioned, please come here. But the worship team can join me. The worship team can join me. Those three categories, just come right here.